Thank you, Chris. I want to echo what Chris said in that we are a parachurch ministry. We are not the church. In fact, we are not even really a parachurch ministry, appropriately, as a parachurch ministry is a ministry that comes alongside the church. We are more so a sub-church ministry, a ministry that serves the church, that comes under the church, a ministry that strives to listen to the church, to understand the needs of the church, and provide the church globally with resources that can help serve the church and advance the gospel and the Word of God so that the Great Commission might be fulfilled in all its fullness. That said, as it is something I often say at the beginning of conferences, wherever I might be speaking, is that conferences are wonderful. We get to see a lot of old friends. They're wonderful times, almost like family reunions. We get to hear teaching from the Word of God and about the Word of God and the theology of the Word of God. But I want us all to remember that conferences are not ultimate. We are called to be faithful churchmen, faithful church women. We are called to attend regularly to the means of grace that God has given us as His people. They keep changing the time on me here, going from 45 to 40. I think it's going to go to 30 minutes here in just a second, the longer I speak. <laughs> so I know that I'm preaching to the choir, but sometimes the choir needs to be preached to. And we need to be reminded that we are first and foremost called to be faithful members of our local churches. So, with that, I want to also say that this is a conference, and um, I will not be preaching in the typical manner that I do at St. Andrew's in morning and evening on the Lord's Day, going verse by verse. Right now, we are making our way through Romans and coming to the end of Romans very quickly in Romans 16 and preaching through 1 Peter in the evenings. Today we're going to be considering the omnipotence of God, the power of God. And we'll be looking at a passage of Scripture and a few passages later on. But be mindful that as we consider this topic, a topic and a subject, an attribute of God that all Christians should agree on, I think that what we'll find is that there are, in fact, many Christians who do not, in truth, agree on this most foundational attribute of who our God is and how He acts. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank You for Your love for us. We thank You for Your goodness. We thank You for all, all that You are and all Your glorious attributes, that You are a holy God and that You are a sovereign God that You are a gracious God, and that You are a loving God. Lord, help us by Your Holy Spirit, not only to understand Your Word, but to love Your Word, not just to read Your Word, but to study Your Word and con consume Your Word and to be consumed by it. Make us even more hungry for Your Word. Help us, Lord, to be faithful men and women, boys and girls. Help us to be faithful as we rest and the once for all finished work and faithfulness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name and for whose glory we pray. Amen. Now, if you're a Christian, you confess what all Christians throughout the ages have confessed. You and your churches and we and our church will often confess the Apostles' Creed. And when we confess the Apostles' Creed, we begin by saying what? I believe in God, the Father Almighty. Now, if you confess that, which all Christians ought to confess, all Christians ought to believe, and all Christians claim they believe, if you confess that, if you believe that, then you are in essence confessing heartily that you believe that God is all-powerful you are confessing that God is almighty. You are confessing that God is great and God is awesome, that God is the God of Israel, He is the King of kings, He is the Lord of lords, that nothing is too difficult for God. You are confessing that God is the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, that God is creator, that God is sustainer, that all things are upheld by His power. 
You confess in confessing that God is all-powerful, that He is El Shaddai. As God Himself revealed Himself to Abraham, firstly, in calling Himself that, He was declaring to Abraham that He is God Almighty, God All-Powerful. That's God's self-disclosure, because theology comes from God. As I first learned from one of my mentors and friends, Dr. Sinclair Ferguson, years ago in quoting Thomas Aquinas, who said, theology proceeds from God, it teaches us about God, and it leads us back to God. It leads us back to God in knowing God and loving God and worshiping God. If our theology that proceeds from God doesn't teach us about God and doesn't lead us back to God in doxology, then it's not biblical theology. The theology that comes from God, it informs us, it changes us, it brings us to our knees in worship and prayer and faith and repentance. And that's God's self-disclosure. God says that He is powerful, that nothing is too difficult for Him. Now, if I went around the room this morning and I surveyed all of you and I said, do you believe that God is all-powerful? Do you believe that God is omnipotent? Everyone in this room, I am almost certain, would say, yes, I believe that God is all-powerful. I believe that God is omnipotent. If we went around to all the members of our churches throughout the world, if we went around to Christians from every different walk and every different denomination, and if they're Christians who confess the Apostles' Creed and they believe that God is almighty, and we say to them and we ask them, do you believe that God is all-powerful? Do you believe that God is omnipotent? What are they going to say? Yes. But then if you ask them this question, you might get a different response. Is God all-powerful over salvation? Is God all-powerful in regenerating, in redeeming? Is God all-powerful in justifying? Is God all-powerful over everyone's will? Can anyone resist the will of God? Is God all-powerful over the good and the bad? Is God all-powerful in His justice and in all His decisions? Is God all-powerful in His saving and in His condemning? Then you might get a different answer. And so, while all Christians claim to believe that God is omnipotent and all-powerful, too often, too many Christians sitting in too many pews and too many churches, in fact, do not believe that God is all-powerful because they deny that God is all-powerful when it comes to salvation and their very own will. Now, at this point, I want to stop and say that some of you realize, those of you who are careful students of theology and of the Scriptures, you know precisely where I'm headed you know that this is the issue about which so many people disagree. And it was an issue and was a matter and a doctrine that I myself disagreed with, and not only disagreed with this whole matter of God's omnipotence and God's sovereign power over salvation. I didn't just disagree with it. I hated it. I fought against it for about two and a half years of my life, studying theology in the original languages and looking at all of Scripture, trying to do everything I possibly could with all the free will I could possibly muster, convince myself <laughs> convince myself that what Scripture seemed to be saying was not actually true about the God that I believed was all-powerful and all-loving and all-good. Those of you who know Dr. Sproul's story know that he fought against it for about five years of his life. For those of us who fought and came kicking and screaming to understanding the sovereign power of God and the omnipotence of God in salvation, many of us, we struggled and we fought, and it was hard. You know, I never went through, at least in my mind, I never went through what so many refer to as that cage stage Calvinism, where they kick and scream and kick against the goads, and they finally come to a place where they 
they recognize and acknowledge God's sovereign power and salvation, but then they start beating up everyone around them as if they should get it immediately. I never went through that because it was hard for me, because these doctrines are hard. These doctrines are difficult. They're difficult not because the Bible makes them difficult, because we in our sinful minds and our finite minds make them difficult, because we are not God. And we don't understand the ways of God. His ways are past finding out. We cannot understand the mysteries of our triune God. All that we can do is learn from what He has revealed to us, for us and our children. Anyone who tries to make you think that you're stupid or foolish or ignorant and you just need to get it. Dearly beloved, what you need to do is you need to study Scripture. Not just read it, but study it. Because for so many of us from so many different traditions, we come to Scripture with our own ideas about who God is and about what God should do, about what God shouldn't do. And you often hear people say things like this, well, my God, and usually what follows that demonstrates that it's not the God of Scripture. My God wouldn't do this. My God couldn't do that. And so even now, as we don't want to create a straw man argument, there are many who are even here today. As I remember myself sitting with friends somewhere right about there in the balcony, in 1997, my second national conference here, still wrestling with these things, still struggling with these things, coming to a prescience view that was a semi-Pelagian view of these matters, of God's power and of God's sovereignty and salvation, thinking that I finally had an answer, but realizing that what I actually believed was an ancient church heresy. We struggle with these things. These things are hard. And so as we consider God's power, and as we consider God's omnipotence, as we consider how it is that God is all-powerful, that nothing is too difficult for God, where we need to focus our attention, because where the greatest amount of difference and debate is, regards God's sovereignty over salvation. Turn with me to Romans chapter 9. Now, at St. Andrews, in our study of Romans, I spent numerous, numerous weeks in Romans chapter 9, and I'm sorry to say, but I'm sure you're grateful to hear that we won't be spending the next several hours in Romans 9. But what I would like to do is give a brief survey, looking at a couple of other different passages in Scripture, all the way through about verse 24. And so, we're going to read section by section, I'm going to make brief comments so as to help us get the argument that Paul is making. Understand that I won't be able to comment on everything. I won't be able to deal with everything in this text, but hopefully we can cover some of the essentials to help us better understand how it is that God is indeed all-powerful and how it is indeed that God is gracious. Paul writes, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing, unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Do you hear Paul's heart? Do you hear Paul's anguish? Do you see how Paul's heart is broken over so many of his fellow kinsmen, Jews, who had rejected the long-awaited Messiah? Do you hear Paul's heart for the lost who are dying and going to hell apart from the Messiah? Paul begins Romans 9 with a heart for the lost. Paul begins Romans 9 with, with describing in the most sincere terms he possibly could, saying, please believe me, 
I really mean this. I'm not just saying this. I'm not just giving lip service to my real heart for those who are gods who have rejected the Christ. He begins with a heart for the lost and a heart even for the gospel going to the lost. It's a heart for evangelism. It's a heart for missions. And then at the beginning of chapter 10, just see briefly, Paul writes again with no chapter divisions, of course, in the original, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. He's praying for them. He doesn't just have a heart for the lost, he's praying for the lost. So often, so many circles, I keep continuing to hear this nonsense about those who understand and believe the doctrine of God's sovereign power and salvation, that we don't believe in evangelism, that we don't believe in prayer, that we're just a bunch of frozen chosen who don't care because God is sovereign, He's going to do whatever He wants, and He doesn't need us. Balderdash. We as God's people who love the grace of our Lord and love the gospel of God and believe in the sovereignty of God. We believe that God is sovereign. We believe that God has foreordained all things that come to pass, yet He is neither the author nor the approver of sin or evil. We who believe that, that He is the primary and ultimate cause of all things, we also firmly believe that He is also the one who has ordained secondary means. God ordains not only the means of all ends, He ordains the ends of all things. He ordains both the ends and the means to those ends, and He has ordained that we pray. He has ordained that we evangelize and proclaim the gospel. He has ordained even that we would have a heart for the lost. Do you have a heart for the lost? Spurgeon goes so far as to say, if you don't have a heart for the lost, you yourself might be lost. Paul was grieving in his spirit for the lost. This was the people of God, the ethnic people of God to whom God had given His Word, His promises, His oracles, His laws, His commandments. God chose this people, this, this ethnic people who were not a people, and God made them a people. They were a little nation, and God gave to them His promises, His laws, His oracles. And Paul's heart longed to see them saved, and he prayed to that end. But, he writes in verse 6, it is not as though the Word of God has failed. This is significant. It is not as though the Word of God has failed. You see, that was the question. Has God's Word, has His promise failed? If God called a nation and He declared that these were His people, what gives? Why aren't they all saved? Why don't they know the Lord Jesus Christ? Why didn't they receive the long-awaited Messiah that was first promised after the fall in Genesis 3? Why weren't they all believing? Didn't Christ come to save His people from their sins? Yes, but who His people are needed some further clarification, and that's precisely what Paul is doing here in Romans 9. Who are the chosen of God? Who are the chosen of the Lord? And just as Paul explained in Romans 4 and even in Romans 5, that it is by faith, just as Abraham believed and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, that is the language of justification, we believe. And we who believe are the sons of Abraham. We are the seed of Abraham because it is by the Spirit, not by the flesh. It is by faith, not by our ethnic connection. So, it's not as if the Word of God has failed. And now Paul is about to explain how it is the Word of God has not failed. How it is that God is all-powerful, that God's promises cannot be undone, they cannot be taken back. That God's Word has done exactly what God intended for it to do. That God's Word will accomplish all that God has intended it to accomplish. But notice that word, all that God has intended, a key word all that God has willed that it would accomplish. You see, there's the rub. Because when we say that 
God is all-powerful, we are not saying that God can do anything. Can God do anything? Don't answer. Those of you who are careful theologians and know your confessions and catechisms well, you know that the answer to that question is no, not really. Because God cannot go against His will. God cannot go against His nature. God cannot break His promises. God cannot be overcome. He cannot be denied. He cannot be created. He cannot be destroyed. God cannot lie. God cannot do that which is out of accord with His character, that which is out of accord with His will or His intent. But God can do all that He wills. And as Augustine said, this is not limiting God's power. This is showing that God has absolute and true power over all. Because if God could do those things, He wouldn't be God. It's not as though the Word of God has failed, and so Paul explains. He explains to a largely Gentile audience with some Jews, many Jews who are filtering back into Rome after Claudius died, having expelled the Jews from Rome in 49. Now, having died in 54, many of the Jews were coming back into the Rome, Roman churches. And so, writing to a largely Gentile audience, but still some Jews, in this magnum opus, Paul explains that the Word of God has not failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham, because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Paul has just now begun to make his argument, and this argument is in the form of theodicy. Now, when I use the word theodicy, Many people instantly go to the classic work by Homer and think that I'm saying the Odyssey. Chuck, we got it, right? Okay. We're not saying the Odyssey. We are speaking of the Odyssey, one word, wherein we are seeing Paul give a justification in order to vindicate God who is both good and who allows evil. How can a good God permit evil? If God is good, why is there evil? The bigger question, by the way, that I often ask when I'm asked that question, wherever I am out in the world, and they say, well, if God is good, if God is just, if God is holy, if God is all-powerful, then why is there evil? And my question is, why is there not more evil? If you understand the sinfulness of man, if you have a, a right regard and a high regard for the total depravity of man, the question is, why isn't there greater evil in the world? Why isn't there more sin? Why aren't there more mass shootings and murders and suicides and abortions? Because God is good, and He restrains evil by His Spirit and by His law so that we might even have been born and exist as the elect of God from all eternity. But that's what Paul's doing. He's giving us a theodicy, an explanation, a defense, and a vindication of God's ways because many people are asking, this doesn't make sense. This whole Christianity thing doesn't make sense. This was the same God you're saying, right, Paul? This is the same God who came and dwelt among us, took on flesh, and His very own people to whom were given the Word of God, the, the, the first gospel, the commandments, the oracles, they've rejected Him, and you're still trying to convince us that this Christianity is true? Paul is saying, too many of you haven't really been reading the Word of God, and for so many of the Jews, they were actually just more busy studying their traditions rather than the Word of God. And that has been the case in the church for so many years and among so many that they are more consumed with studying their traditions even studying their techniques and their programs than they are studying the Word of God. In our day, too many churches and too many Christians are studying the culture rather than the Word of God. They're taking their cues from culture rather than from the Word of God. 
Paul says you need to understand what the Bible says. You need to understand what the Word of God actually does say. And so Paul, as he quotes the Old Testament throughout Romans 9, what he is demonstrating is that this is not new. That this understanding of God's sovereignty and salvation, God's sovereignty and election is nothing new. It goes all the way back to the very beginning. Let me give you some examples, Paul says. Here is Isaac. Isaac was chosen and not Ishmael. And then the Jews might say, well, yeah, that that makes sense because Ishmael wasn't a a true, a true, true born son of Abraham. He was of Hagar. So Paul says, okay, well, let me take it one step further. If you don't like that example, let me give you another example. And so Paul argues there in Verse 7 again, through Isaac shall your offspring be named, from Genesis 21. This means that it's not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. Now, he could have just stopped right there. If you understand what Paul is getting at there when he says it's not the children of the flesh, it's not because they were of ethnic Israel, it's because by faith those who were to believe in the Messiah that they are, in fact, the sons of the promise, the true seed of Abraham. They are the ones that God has called, for this is what the promise said, verse 9, about this time next year I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only that, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had not done anything either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue or might stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. Now, let's stop there. Because there's that word that some of you still don't like. Though they were not yet born, and had done nothing either good or bad, You know, Paul didn't need to say that. You know why he said that? Under the superintendence of the Holy Spirit, it seems that what Paul was doing was coming down to our level with all our presuppositions about God, saying what God won't do, what God can't do, what God is not powerful enough to do, or what God certainly wouldn't do. Paul comes down and says, okay, let me try to explain this to you in the most simple way I possibly can had not yet been born. They didn't do anything yet, either good or evil. Just to make it clear, this is before they were born. They hadn't done anything. Paul condescends to us. He comes down to us to explain in the simplest words he possibly can in order that God's purpose of election might stand, that God's purpose and election might continue, that it might be shown for what it is. Not because of works, because of Him who calls. It's not because of our exertion. It's not because of our works. It's because of Him who calls. It's not on account of our works. It's not on account of anything that we do. It's on account of the one who calls. It's on account of the one who elects. And then Paul goes deeper, doubles down, and digs in. He needs for them to understand what election is and what election isn't. He needs them to understand the grace of God in its fullness. He wants them and God wants us to understand how God is powerful, in what ways God has revealed His power. And this is where it gets really hard for so many. And my fear, dearly beloved, my fear is that in covering this today, in looking at this passage today, that many of you are going to come away disliking me or even hating me. And I don't want to be disliked. 
But my bigger concern is that you'd come away rejecting this powerful God. That you would come away and that you would face these doctrines and these truths so blatantly in your face that you would say, I can't believe in that God. That I can't believe in a God who is like this. But here's the, here's the problem. If you can't believe in that God, you don't believe in the God of Scripture. And if you don't believe in the God of Scripture, you don't believe in God and you don't know God and you're not saved. Friends, that's hard to say. But you have to do something with this. You have to somehow reckon with this. And as we delve into this and as we see the the real, real hard part of this doctrine, you can't just ignore it. You can't just relegate it. You can't just say, well, we don't understand that. Paul is wanting you to understand it. God is revealing it to you that you might understand it. Not that you might understand and know the mysteries of God. We can't know the mysteries of the Godhead. But what we can know is what He has revealed. And so listen to what Paul says. Not because of works, but because of Him who calls. Verse 12, she was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Now, some of you in coming to this passage have studied and have read and have heard from preachers this explanation, that really how that could be understood is that what Paul is saying in quoting from Malachi is that Jacob the Lord has loved, but Esau he has loved less. That's a very common interpretation. Now, in reality, we need to understand what Paul is doing here. Paul is employing a very typical method of arguing. It's a Hebraism. Paul is making a contrast indeed, just like Jesus made a contrast and uh, recorded in Luke 14 where Jesus said something along the lines of, if you come to me, you must hate father, mother, wife, children, or you can't be my follower. That was a typical Hebraism, a way of contrasting in order to show that we must love Christ wholly and above all else. That's what Paul's doing. Yet that doesn't get Paul off the hook. Turn with me to Malachi chapter 1, because what we see there in the context of where Paul is quoting from, Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated, we hear this oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. In chapter 1 and verse 2, we read the following. Now, I know that many of you are Baptists and many of you aren't Baptists, but we are at least in a Baptist church, and so you all ought to be there by now. In our congregation, the, uh, my, they're so patient with their pastor because they know if I even mention the text, they ought to get going there as quickly as possible. Malachi chapter 1, we read. See, I just gave you a little extra time. Malachi chapter 1, I have loved you, says the Lord. But you say, how have you loved us? See, they're questioning God, saying, how have you loved us? What about Esau? Did you love Esau? The Edomites, the nation that came from him, that word Edom meaning red from Esau who is red. How have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom says, we are shattered, but we will build the ruins, rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says, they may build, but I will tear down. And they will be called the wicked country. And the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. It's one of the passages to which we turn in understanding the eternality of hell. 
The Lord will be angry forever. Your eyes shall see this, you will behold this, and you shall say, great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. Great, magnificent, mighty, powerful, that this God is a great God. And how is it that He is showing His power? Out of His destruction and His hatred toward Esau and his descendants. So even though Paul is giving to us and employing this Hebraism as Jesus was, We see here from this context clearly what we're talking about. We are talking about judgment and eternal condemnation and the anger of God. Try putting that on a bumper sticker or a billboard. It's not very seeker-friendly. See, those who want to say, well, this is the God of the Old Testament, they need to read the New Testament because He's the same God. And I know this is hard, dearly beloved, but in these hard truths we find the beauty of the grace of God. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. May it never be. God forbid. There is no injustice on God's part as we read from all of Scripture, Deuteronomy 32, Zephaniah 3, that all God's ways are justice, that there is no injustice with God, that God is always just. You can't charge God with being unjust. See, the reality of it is so many of us, we want We want justice for everyone else, but we want mercy for ourselves. You know, when we hear about someone hurting or something that has happened to someone, you know what, sometimes the first thing that pops into our mind is, what did they do to deserve that? But when it happens to us, what do we do? God, what did I do to deserve this? The truth is, God is just and He's merciful. These are not parts of God. These are not attributes sort of put alongside God or things that He possesses, if you will. These are who God is. God is just. God is merciful, as we'll see here in just a moment, how God even defines or discloses who He is even more fully. Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For He says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Now, in Exodus 33, that's right, get going there. In Exodus 33, Moses is interceding for Israel. After the golden calf episode and sin against God, after the Lord had already told the sons of Levi to destroy and to kill their brothers and sisters, About 3,000 fell that day, and a plague came upon Israel. Moses is pleading with the Lord, do not blot my name out. And if if you're going to blot their name out, blot my name out. That's similar to what we hear Paul's heart and cry in Romans 9 and 10. May it come upon me, and Moses pleading as if he could make atonement, which he couldn't. It was only someone greater than Moses who could. He's pleading with the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy upon your people. And then Moses, in interceding, says, Lord, I want to know you. I want to see your glory. I want to know your ways. I want to know who you are. I want to know your being. I want to know who you are. Our God is a holy God. Who are you? Show me your ways. And Moses said to the Lord in verse 12 of 33 of Exodus, see, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me your ways that I may know you. In order to find favor in your sight, consider, too, that this nation is your people. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. Moses speaking in ethnic terms of the nation of Israel, and God helps him to explain why it is that he just had killed about 3,000 of his people. And he said, my presence will go with you, 
and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. If you're not going to go with us, Lord, just let us die here at Mount Sinai. If you're not going to go with me, if you are not going to be with us, then just let us stay. Let us die here. For how shall it be known, verse 16, how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, that I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, we are separate? I and your people from every other people on the face of the earth. Now listen, verse 17, and the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. And then Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, Yahweh, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. God, in declaring Himself and who He is and seeing His glory, seeing His power, seeing His greatness, seeing who God is, Moses must understand that the reason He put so many to death and the reason He brought judgment, but also the reason He is showing mercy also the reason He is showing compassion, also the reason that He will go with them, and also the reason that Moses has found favor with the Lord is because God is the one who shows mercy, and God is the one who shows compassion to those whom He will. No further explanation is needed. And if we grasp that truth, then we will grasp the corollary. We will grasp that which is necessarily connoted by what God has declared about Himself, and Paul makes it crystal clear. So then, verse 16, chapter 9, it does not depend on human will or exertion. Some of your translations have, it doesn't depend on Him who wills or runs. It doesn't depend on our desire, our wanting to, and it doesn't depend on our actions. It doesn't depend on our will. It doesn't depend on our exertion. It depends on God who has mercy. And Paul says, in case it's not clear enough, let me make it even more clear so that you can rightly understand the power of God and how God uses His power in all of history. For the Scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you. See, Pharaoh and all the Egyptians thought that Pharaoh was there by all the gods of Egypt. Pharaoh thought he had power that came from his gods and from his own mighty right arm. God is saying to Pharaoh, I put you there. It was my power that raised you up. I'm the one who made you so successful and so powerful, but you were an instrument that I was using to show forth my power, God said. And so we read the examples from Exodus. For this very purpose I've raised you up, that I might show my power on you, that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault for who can resist his will? That's what they're asking. That's what those who struggle with these doctrines and some of you who still struggle with these doctrines and who struggle with God's power and His sovereignty and salvation and all things, you struggle and you're still asking that question as I asked that question, as I came even to a crisis moment in my life, either questioning Scripture or having to totally have a different view of who the God of Scripture is. Here's Paul's answer. Who are you, O man, to reply against God? Who do you think you are? And when that came to me, it was as if the Lord slapped me upside the face and said, Keep your mouth shut. Who are you?
Who are you to question God? Who are you to question the ways of God? Who are you to question the power of God? Who are you to question the way God has acted throughout history? Who are you to question the almighty, all-powerful creator of all things? Who do you think you are? Paul says, who are you, O man, to answer back to God? It's similar to what we find in Job. Well, what does molded say to its molder? Why have you made it like this? Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show His wrath and to make known His power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? You see, this is that doctrine of reprobation. And there are many Christians who say they believe in the doctrine of election, but if you don't believe in the doctrine of reprobation, you don't believe in the doctrine of election. It's double or nothing. If you don't understand the doctrine of reprobation, you don't understand the doctrine of election. If you don't understand that it is God who ultimately passes over, passes by, and hardens from all eternity because of the sin of mankind, that's the language of our confessional standards, the language of the canons of Dort, but all according to His ordaining power and sovereign choosing. He elects and He chooses, He plucks out and saves, and… He passes over, thereby condemning others. And I know that many of you say, well, that's just not fair. Well, you should be grateful that it's not, because if it were, we'd all be in hell right now. The truth of the matter is, the truth of the matter is that many of us want to ask the question, and we still want to ask this question, especially if we have a heart for the lost. And we're not just talking about the lost out there that we see. We're talking about our friends and our family. We're talking about moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas. We're talking about our own children. We're talking about our grandchildren that may not know the Lord. And we're praying, God, save them. And I pray that they would be among your elect. And when you're on your knees praying for the salvation of those you most dearly love, you would give everything for you say, God, how can it be like this? God, why didn't you just elect everyone? We don't know the answer to that question, except that God has done all things perfectly according to His perfect and sovereign will, and that He's done all things for His glory and His name. And while we cannot fully understand how God works and why He does what He does, we need to rest in His perfect sovereignty and not ask the inappropriate question, God, why don't you elect everyone? Because that is a question that runs right up against the same answer from Paul, who are you? We need to rather ask the more biblically informed question, God, why do you save anyone? Because we were at enmity with you. We are your enemies. We are in opposition to you. And when you came down in the person of your son, we put you on the cross and killed you. Why would he save any of us? Why would he elect anyone? You see, if God just elect one person, he would have shown forth his grace. But that he has elected a people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. Because you and I both know that if we've come to understand these doctrines, that each and every one of us have been able to say, Lord, why me? Why did you save me? Why did you elect me? He did all this to make known the riches of His glory for the vessels of mercy which He had prepared beforehand for glory. You see, friends, it's only when we rightly understand the sovereign power of God in salvation that we can really begin to understand the true omnipotence of God. It's only when we understand the sovereignty of God in salvation that we can understand the grace of God. It's only when we understand the grace of God that we will be able to hear those beautiful words the Lord Jesus Christ said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you not only in salvation, but in all of life. 
And it's when we understand that grace. It's when we rest in the grace of God by the sustaining power of the Holy Spirit. It's only then when we can begin to understand that His power is made perfect in our weakness, in our humility, in our weakness, in our dependence upon Him. Let's pray. Lord, You are God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank You, Father, for saving us, for electing us. Help us, O Lord, to rest in that so great a salvation. Fix our eyes on Jesus Christ and let us rest in the gospel and Your grace which saves us and without which we would be condemned forever. We praise You, Lord, and we thank You. Make us and keep us humble and help us to know always that Your power is made perfect in our weakness. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.